as David has mentioned, the title of my talk is Conquest of the Land, and I have subtitled it, A Critical Look at the Late Paleozoic Fish Tetrapod Transition. Now, I guess we all know what a fish is, but I suppose I ought to begin just by defining what I mean by tetrapod. Uh, a tetrapod is any four-limbed vertebrate. So included in the tetrapods are the amphibians, the reptiles, the birds, the mammals, and of course ourselves. And we're looking at, uh, as David says, the point in the geological record where according to Darwinian interpretations, the fish made that transition to four-limbed vertebrates. And I didn't realize at the time I prepared the talk how topical it would be, but if you picked up a copy of last week's New Scientist, published on Thursday, there was an article entitled, One Small Step for Fish, One Giant Leap for Us. <laughs> because, of course, in, in Darwinian terms, this is the root of our ancestry. So it's a very key transition. In Darwinian terms, this transition was one of the major events in the history of life. It represents a change from water to land, from gill to lung breathing, from swimming to walking. And of course, you need radical alterations to convert a fish into a tetrapod. Changes to the structure and function of the skeleton, its mode of feeding and respiration, its sense organs, and its modes of reproduction. And by way of background, uh, I'd like to review very briefly what the situation was back uh, around the uh, 1980, thereabouts. Back then, most discussions of tetrapod origins in Darwinian circles focused on uh, two creatures in particular, Ichthyostega and Euthanopteron. Now, Euthanopteron was a fish, uh, a particular group called Osteoleepiforms, and Ichthyostega was uh, an amphibian and considered to be a reasonably typical land vertebrate, although with some primitive features that must have evolved from a fish somewhat like Euthanopteron during the geological past. And the part of the geological column that this, these events took place in uh, is around the time of the Devonian. And it was thought that periodic uh, drying of the climate throughout the Silurian and the Devonian period led to pressure for the fish to leave the water and evolve into uh, land animals. Within the last two decades, a major re-evaluation has taken place within evolutionary circles. And almost every aspect of that older view of tetrapod origins has been completely overturned. And we need to be aware of that. And in this uh, lecture, I'd like to review the fossil discoveries that have prompted that re-evaluation. We'll look, first of all, at the early tetrapod fossils. Then we'll look at the search for their presumed fish ancestors. I want to look at the timing of the transition and the controversies about it. And also look at the changing views of the nature of the setting of this transition, the ecological and environmental setting. And then I want to come on to look at what the implications are of these basic data for both creationist and Darwinian models. Well, before we actually go and look at the fossils themselves, uh, we really need to familiarize ourselves with the part of the geological column with which we're dealing. And so this is a slide showing uh, the divisions of the geological column in the area where we're interested. Now, if you know your geological column, you'll be aware that there are major divisions uh, called erythems. So there's the Precambrian, there's the Paleozoic, this is going from oldest to youngest, Precambrian, Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and Cenozoic. And we're focusing on the Paleozoic erythem. Now, within the Paleozoic erythem, there are various geological systems, subdivisions, and uh, if, again, if you know your column, there's Cambrian, Ordovician, Silurian, Devonian, Carboniferous, and Permian in the Paleozoic. 
we're particularly interested here in the Devonian, and in particular in the Upper Devonian, to be even more specific. And even if you're familiar with some of these terms, what you may not be so familiar with are the subdivisions of these systems. So the Upper Devonian is divided into two uh, stages, the Frasnian and the Fermenian. And we, we just need to uh, know, basically, that these are subdivisions of the Upper Devonian. Frasnian is the oldest and Fermenian is, is younger. And then uh, we may later uh, briefly talk about some of the lower Carboniferous. So we have here subdivisions of the Carboniferous, the Tornasian, the Visean, and the Namurian. But really, uh, if you can remember these terms, the, the Upper Devonian consisting of Frasnian and Fermenian, then that will help very greatly. Now, the ages that I've placed there are the conventional ages accepted by Darwinian scientists. And I don't accept those ages. They're based on radiometric data. And I uh, don't accept that time scale. But they are the conventional ages accepted in the, in the uh, literature. OK, well, let's take a look at the early tetrapods. The most well-known early tetrapods come from Fermenian sediments of East Greenland and were discovered there during expeditions back in uh, the 1930s. Uh, one worker, Save Soderberg, back in 1932, published some preliminary descriptions of the tetrapod fossils that he'd found, but unfortunately he died prematurely in 1948 and was not able to complete his work. His colleague, Eric Jarvik, took up the task and presented further details of, uh, of this fossil material, but it wasn't believe it or not, until 1996 when a full anatomical description of the most important of these fossils was published, 1996. That was Ichthyostega. Now, if we have a look at Ichthyostega, uh, we can see uh, two reconstructions of Ichthyostega here, one a skeletal reconstruction, one a reconstruction as he may have appeared in life. Uh, if you'd notice about this animal, he's about one meter long. He has a broad, flat head, somewhat crocodile-like in appearance, in body shape. Has a barrel-shaped body, stocky legs, large pelvic and pectoral girdles, and a, a rib cage made up of broad, overlapping ribs. He's clearly a tetrapod. He has limbs with digits rather than fins. However, there are some characteristics of Ichthyostega that are shared with certain fishes from the Upper Paleozoic, including details of the, the bones of the skull, the structure of the teeth, the fact that he possessed a lateral line for sense, uh, sensing in the water, as, as fishes do, uh, a middle ear that appears to have been adapted for underwater hearing, and a tail fin. And you will notice that in Eusthenopteron, one of the osteolipiform fishes, you have a, a tail fin with these fin rays. And they are technically called Lepidotrichia. And we find Lepidotrichia on the tail of the specimens of Ichthyostega. So we find fish-like fin rays on the tail of these animals. And if you look at the photographs in Jarvik's monograph, you'll see that very clearly. Now, because of these somewhat fish-like characteristics, Ichthyostega featured very prominently in discussions of tetrapod ancestry. And he was thought to be the uh, earliest ancestor of all of the land animals. Nevertheless, he was pictured predominantly not as a fish-like animal, but as a land-dwelling vertebrate, very distinct from the fish, from which he evolved. And I have a quote here from a uh, very well-known vertebrate paleontologist, Robert Carroll, who said, we have not found any fossils that are intermediate between such clearly terrestrial animals and the strictly aquatic ripodistians. That's the kind of fish that Eusthenopteron is. Now, that was back in 1988. But there have been more recent discoveries. And since uh, Carroll wrote his textbook, our knowledge of Devonian tetrapods has greatly expanded and led to a major reevaluation. We now have eight known genera of Devonian tetrapods. And we, we'll look at each of those in turn in just a moment. 
And not only are there eight genera, but they are morphologically diverse. They're very different in appearance. They're globally distributed. We now have fossil material not only from East Greenland, but we have material from Scotland, America, Australia, Latvia, and Russia. And moreover, contrary to this older view of Ichthyostega as a very typical land-dwelling vertebrate, it appears that the Devonian tetrapods were very unusual animals indeed. They were very peculiar animals. I have another quote here from Robert Carroll's textbook back in 1988, where he was able there, based on Jarvik's descriptions of Ichthyostega, to say that as in most primitive tetrapods, Ichthyostega has five distal tarsals and five digits. This is a description of the, the, the digits on the limb. So that was the description, five digits. And it was thought that uh, five digits was a primitive condition, and that's why we've all got five fingers, because we've inherited it from an ancestor that had five digits back there in the Devonian. <clears throat> However, there were new specimens of Ichthyostega and another creature called Acanthostega, uh, and they included articulated limbs, and they were collected by an expedition to East Greenland in 1987, and they revealed something rather curious. Here's Acanthostega, the forelimb, and if you count the digits, you'll see there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight digits, obviously a very peculiar animal. There are no animals today like that. And Ichthyostega was uh, looked at again in the light of the new discoveries from East Greenland, and it was found that there were seven digits on the hind limb. Now, this fell into line with uh, an earlier uh, discovery that was, had previously been quite obscure, but was actually described back in 1984, another uh, early tetrapod called Tulerpaton. And the forelimb of Tulerpaton had six digits, so there appeared no consistency and it was very peculiar that these animals had weird numbers of digits on the hands. So they were biologically very unusual animals in some respects. Okay, well let's briefly review the main tetrapod genera. I said that there are now eight genera known. Uh, let's begin with Tulerpaton. Uh, he's the youngest, stratigraphically, of uh, the Devonian tetrapods, and we'll kind of work our way backwards in the geological column. Tulerpaton consists of fore and hind limbs, incomplete pectoral and pelvic girdles and skull fragments found in the upper Fermenian. In Moscow, uh, we've mentioned the six digits. That's Tulerpaton. If we go to the next slide, we'll see Ventastiga. Now, this was the first tetrapod find from the upper Fermenian in Latvia. It consists of disarticulated cranial and postcranial material. Uh, at first, it was actually assigned to a fish, and with the discovery of uh, further material, it was realized that this was, uh, this was reinterpreted by one of the experts in the field, Per Alberg of the Natural History Museum, as a tetrapod similar to Ichthyostega and Acanthostega. The next genera, uh, genus is Acanthostega, the one that we've already mentioned from East Greenland, uh, mid to upper Fermenian. Uh, again, Acanthostega, as you can see from the reconstruction there, is a peculiar animal. It had limbs, certainly the forelimbs, look as though they probably were unable to bear the weight of the body on land. And Acanthostega may also have had internal gills, uh, it's been suggested. And like Ichthyostega, Acanthostega had a tail fin with fin rays and a lateral line. The next genus is Hynerpaton, which is from the mid fermenian of Pennsylvania in America, described back in 1994, and uh, it consists of pectoral girdle and skull fragments. The next genus is Metaxinathus, which is a single lower jaw thought to be from lower fermenian sediments in Australia. Uh, there's a lot of controversy about the exact nature of this jaw. Some workers argue that it's tetrapod. Other workers argue that it belongs to an osteolepiform fish. And I guess without uh, further material being found, then that controversy is unlikely to be resolved. And then we have Elginerpaton, 
uh, found in Scotland, uh, near Elgin, uh, from the Scat Craig beds, Upper Frasnian. And this was very fragmentary material. It's some of the oldest tetrapod material that's ever been found, but it was extremely fragmentary, isolated skeletal elements. And uh, really, it's not even clear from the original descriptions of the finds whether they relate to the same animal, but it was assumed that uh, it was unlikely that there were uh, going to be other tetrapods around at the same time, and so it was thought that this probably all related to the same animal. But the, the question is an open one. And with, again, without more complete material, preferably articulated, we can't really resolve those issues. Finally, we have Obruchevichthys, which is an upper Frasnian form from Latvia. Very little is known about it, uh, but it's, again, very fragmentary. It's just lower, lower jaw material. So those are the eight main genera of early tetrapods. And one thing perhaps to mention is that almost all of them apart from Ichthyostega and Acanthostega, almost all of them uh, are single specimens. So very little is really known about these animals. Much of it is fragmentary. But there are well-preserved specimens with more than one uh, specimen available, like Ichthyostega and Acanthostega, which are much better known. Well, now let's think about the search for the ancestors of these creatures. These are thought to be the first land animals, so what about their ancestors? Well, we can trace the controversy about the origin of the tetrapods back to the middle of the 19th century when lungfishes were first described. South American and African lungfishes were first brought to Europe in 1837. Some workers described them as amphibians, whereas others, like Sir Richard Owen, were convinced that they should be classified as Fishes, And the consensus that emerged from that controversy was that, yes, these were fishes, but they were the most tetrapod-like of fishes. Uh, now, some Darwinists, such as Ernst Haeckel, a name that will be familiar to many of you, regarded the uncertainty about the classification of these fishes as evidence of their transitional or ancestral status. In 1870, the Australian lungfish was discovered, and that was initially described as an amphibian also. Interestingly, in 1872, it was fully described by a worker called Gunther, who argued that the lungfishes were completely unrelated to amphibians. And Gunther was also the first to recognize that certain fossil fishes, like Dipterus in the Middle Devonian, were also forms of lungfishes. And Gunther was a firm opponent of Darwinism, who used the existence of these living fossils persisting from the Paleozoic as evidence against Darwinism. Nevertheless, in the late 19th century, the prevailing view was that the lungfishes were either the ancestors or at least the nearest relatives of tetrapods. And then at the turn of the century, opinion shifted against the lungfishes. It was thought that they were too specialized to have given rise to the tetrapods. And instead, a number of workers began to argue that both the lungfishes and the tetrapods were in fact descended from a group of fishes called Crossopterygians. Now, the Crossopterygians are a group that include uh, the coelacanths, for example. So that, that will give you an idea of those kinds of uh, fish. Now, today, we classify the lungfishes, the coelacanths, and a group called the Ripidistians in a single group. And we call them the lobe fins, the Sarcopterygii. And they're the lobe fin fishes. And they are prominent in those fish faunas in the late Paleozoic. Today, uh, they're only represented by four genera, but they're very prominent in the upper Paleozoic sediments. But opinion then moved on from there and moved on from uh, the Crossopterygians and, in fact, focused on another of these lobe-finned fish groups, the Ripidistians. And one very famous Ripidistian in particular, this creature, Eusthenopteron. Now, there are two major groups of Ripidistians. There are the Poroleepiforms and the Osteoleepiforms. And it was thought that the Osteoleepiforms, like Eusthenopteron, were a more appropriate tetrapod ancestor. Despite the fact that, as, one, uh, as two workers have, have written, they are morphologically rather undistinguished fishes with no unambiguous structural adaptations to an amphibious mode of life. Nevertheless, you're familiar, I'm sure, with museum exhibits showing fish like these hauling themselves up onto Devonian riverbanks 
and making forays onto the land. And those kinds of images were very popular in textbooks uh, and very common in museum exhibits. And this was the whole concept of the conquest of the land. Today, in fact, opinion has shifted again away from Eusthenopteron and away from the osteolipi forms to a formerly obscure group of fishes called pandarichthids. Now, the pandarichthids were originally included among the osteolipi forms, but are now classified as a, a separate group. And new material uh, from Latvia and Canada is said to show that these pandarichthid fish are very much more tetrapod-like than the other osteolipi form fish. And while some workers don't agree, uh, increasingly, opinion is shifting in the favor of the pandarichthids as the closest relatives of tetrapods. They have uh, a similarly, uh, similar to tetrapods, they have this kind of crocodile-like shape with broad, flat heads, dorsally placed orbits, so the eyes are on the top of the head, so maybe they were able to be in shallow water and see out of the water a bit like the, the four-eyed fish anableps that you may have uh, seen in wildlife programs. It's been suggested that uh, maybe they were capable of uh, basic terrestrial locomotion like the modern catfish. And they have certain similarities in terms of the structure of the skull to tetrapods. And so they're regarded as fish that lived in extremely shallow water and they're considered to be extremely close to the ancestry of the tetrapods. But it is acknowledged that they cannot be the actual ancestor of the tetrapods. They are thought to be extremely close to the ancestry, but not the actual ancestors, because they have some unique characteristics, such as the structure of the vertebrae, which rule them out as direct ancestors. So they regard as a kind of model of the, the, the type of fish that must have served as the tetrapod ancestor. But it has to be said the actual ancestor is not found in the fossil record. These, at best, can give us a, an idea of what that ancestor in evolutionary terms may have looked like. An interesting comment from Keith Thompson, another vertebrate paleontologist. He wrote this in a, 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 a Paleontological Society uh, course notes on uh, the origin of the tetrapods. He said, while we still do not have any really intermediate fossil forms between fishes and tetrapods, we are getting closer with the description of Pandarichthys and Elpistostege. We are free to argue vociferously about the identity of the group of fishes that must be the tetrapod ancestor. This is like the joke about the baseball player who, although he was terrible at bat, couldn't field either. <laughs> okay, we've looked at the early tetrapods. We've looked at the uh, potential ancestors for these animals in Darwinian terms. Let's go on and look at uh, some controversies about the timing of the transition, because this has been an area that has been debated uh, very fiercely just recently within the last uh, three years. The oldest skeletal material we've mentioned is uh, Upper Frasnian. We have Elgin Erpeton and Obruchevic, this in the Upper Frasnian. But that material is very fragmentary. We really can't tell very much about those animals. The most complete specimens, Ichthyostega and Acanthostega, as we've mentioned, were collected from sediments in East Greenland. And these rocks uh, were originally described as Upper Devonian, although a lower Carboniferous age was su suggested later by at least one worker. But that younger date, that Carboniferous date, was not widely accepted. Recently, though, that whole controversy about the age of these rocks in East Greenland has been reignited by some paleomagnetic and radiometric work done on nearby sedimentary rocks just here. This is where the tetrapod uh, discoveries were found. Here are some sedimentary rocks that are uh, uh, thought to be uh, younger. They're thought to actually underlie the rocks that contain the tetrapods. And the radiometric date that was uh, achieved from these rocks was a, an argon-argon date of 336 million years for a basalt that underlies the tetrapod-bearing sediments. Now, this is interesting because the 336 million year date makes the rocks underlying these supposedly Devonian sediments carboniferous. Now, of course, that cannot be the case. 
uh, if the rocks sitting on top are Devonian. They, they must be uh, younger than the Carboniferous, if that's the case. And there are profound implications if these radiometric dates are correct. Let me just give you a quote to show you the kind of consternation this has provoked among some of the workers. It's quite a lengthy quote, but it, it does reveal their thinking. First, the tetrapods Acanthostega and Ichthyostega would necessarily be about 20 million years younger than previously considered. These taxa are widely regarded as the earliest tetrapod fossils for which articulated material is available and are fundamental in studies of the origin and evolution of the group. Our understanding of the timing of the fish to tetrapod transition would consequently be drastically altered. Cladistic analysis has consistently shown that Acanthostega and Ichthyostega are phylogenetically, that is in terms of family tree, uh, the most primitive of the tetrapods. These primitive character states include multi-digited limbs, retention of caudal fin rays, and in Acanthostega, a persistent internal gill skeleton. According to the radiometric dates, either these two genera would have to be late surviving remnants of an earlier transitional event, or alternatively, the transition took place extremely rapidly because well-preserved, terrestrially adapted tetrapods are known from rocks of Visayan age in the Carboniferous. Additionally, the associated fish faunas found widely distributed throughout the world would either be very late surviving remnants of a fauna found elsewhere in Upper Devonian sedimentary rocks, or all these faunas have been incorrectly dated. So there was very real consternation at these radiometric dates. And to resolve this issue, some of the workers who defended the Devonian date collected spore samples from the sedimentary rocks that contain the tetrapod fossils. And they produced a detailed stratigraphic section through the sediments and did some work looking at the spore samples, and they concluded that this unambiguously supports a Devonian, an upper Devonian age for these sediments. And so they are in conflict now with the radiometric dates. Radiometric and paleomagnetic dates that are in direct conflict with fossil dates, with biostratigraphic dates. And clearly both cannot be correct. Something has to give here. And those uh, workers who've published the radiometric dates are insistent that their dates are soundly based geologically and experimentally. And those who have done the fossil work are sure that the Upper Devonian age for these rocks is well-founded. And so there's a, a conflict and a debate that seems set to continue. Uh, this, by the way, is just a, a diagram that was published by the workers who did the spore sample analysis. And uh, they actually argued on the basis of their spore samples that, in fact, Ichthyostega and Acanthostega were somewhat older than had previously been considered, and instead of being upper fermenian, were mid fermenian So this has led to some re-evaluation. If we go to the next slide, we'll see that not only have we uh, controversy about the skeletal material relating to these early tetrapods, but we also have controversy about their trackways because we find trace fossils, we find trackways and footprints in the fossil record. And here we have some of the major discoveries. Uh, from Australia, we have a trackway in a loose block where the date and the provenance of the block are uncertain, thought possibly to be upper Silurian to lower Devonian. From ERA, we have a single tetrapod trackway mid to upper Devonian. In Brazil, there's a single print in an isolated block mid to upper Devonian. And in Australia, we have three trackways, two of fairly definite tetrapod origin, the third much less certain than their upper Devonian. Now, there's no real controversy about the upper Devonian ones. This one is very, very uncertain because it's a single print. And in fact, there are some workers who believe it's not a tetrapod print at all, but the resting trace of a starfish. And there are other possible uh, explanations of that, uh, that marking on that rock. In ERA, there's a fairly well-established tetrapod trackway, so that appears to be uh, fa fairly well uh, attested. The trackway in Australia, because it's in a loose block that was actually used, I believe, in a courtyard of a, a, an old building, it's, uh, the, the scientists have tried to find out where this block came from, and they've speculated about uh, its exact location, but of course, uh, it's now uh, a loose block. It can't be verified where it came from. And so the date and the provenance of that block 
is uncertain, but if that is a genuine tetrapod trackway from the upper Silurian to lower Devonian, then that causes the evolutionists real problems because it makes the tetrapod origin much lower in the column than they would feel comfortable with. And so they're very quick to, uh, d to dismiss this because of the uncertainty over the age. Now, I think we can't make too much of that, but it is interesting that maybe uh, the tetrapod trackways go back further than, uh, than is commonly uh, thought. So to sum up, the earliest tetrapod skeletal material is, uh, is upper Frasnian. There's trace fossil evidence suggestive of tetrapods back to at least the late middle Devonian. Now the pandarichthids, these fish that are considered the most tetrapod-like of fishes, appear in the lower Frasnian. Now this means that the timing of that transition from fish to tetrapod is very, very tightly constrained. In fact, if there really are genuine either skeletal material or trackways of tetrapods going back beyond that point, then it makes them older than the fish from which they are presumed to have evolved. So there are very real uh, problems here, and this is an extremely tightly constrained uh, transition. Okay, if we go on now to look at the ecological and environmental setting of uh, the transition, a key part of Darwinian thinking has been to explain the uh, selection pressures behind the transition. And most of these scenarios have assumed that the origin of tetrapods, four-limbed vertebrates, is the same as the invasion of the land by vertebrates. And a classic paper by Farrell back in 1916 set the scene for much future discussion. He argued that an increasingly arid climate throughout the Silurian and the Devonian was a major influence on the evolution of air-breathing vertebrates. And as the climatic conditions became more strenuous, the air bladder of certain fishes became progressively better adapted as an organ of respiration, the gills atrophied, and the development of this new system of breathing allowed fishes to survive drought conditions by moving from one body of water to another. This became known as the drying pond hypothesis and was popularized particularly in the 50s by the great vertebrate paleontologist Alfred Romer. Uh, and he was the one, I think, who coined this term, drying pond hypothesis. Now, support for the drying pond hypothesis came primarily from the nature of the Silurian and Devonian rocks of America and Europe. In Europe, we have the old red sandstone and its equivalents in North America, the Catskill and the Eskumenak formations. And these rocks are characteristically stained red by iron oxide. They're called red beds. And these red beds are often interpreted as the product of hot semi-desert environments with seasonal wetness. But there is a problem here, because we can be too simplistic about the origin of these red beds. And at least one geologist here reviewing the data on red beds said the red bed problem has been extremely controversial with marked differences of opinion, possibly due to the fact that the term red bed is a catch-all for many sedimentary types produced under different conditions, the only common feature of them being the red color. So whether these rocks are generally formed in that kind of environment is at least open to question. But furthermore, and perhaps more importantly, the new discoveries of early, uh, of, of, uh, early tetrapods have led some workers in the field to argue that these early tetrapods are not animals making forays onto the land. They're not fish making forays onto the land. They were actually predominantly themselves aquatic in their habits. And we have uh, proponents of the conquest of the land notion, typified by these museum exhibits of fish kind of hauling themselves up onto the land. And that idea has largely now been rejected. What is thought to have happened is that the key tetrapod characteristics, such as limbs with digits, are thought to have evolved in an aquatic environment for use in the water and were only later co-opted for use on the land. Now, some years ago, this kind of thinking used to be called pre-adaptation, but the uh, design or teleological overtones of that term have led other workers to suggest the term exaptation. And so the limbs 
evolved in the water for use in the water and have become exacted to the terrestrial environment. And contemporary depictions of these early tetrapods, like this one, this reconstruction of Acanthostega, show them as predominantly aquatic animals. And this one is uh, reproduced in, a, in a, its swimming position, in a swimming mode, rather than in a walking posture on land, as was often the case in earlier, uh, in earlier writings. OK, well, now we've looked at the data, let's move on and think about the important issues and challenges that these fossils raise for both creationist and Darwinian models. So we'll think, first of all, about the basic data. And there are two points here that I think need to be drawn out from all of this. The first is that in the fossil record, we see a mosaic distribution of characters. We have panderichthid fish, which have some tetrapod-like characteristics in terms of the skull, body morphology, and so on. Conversely, we have upper Devonian tetrapods that appear to have many fish-like characteristics, like the lateral line, like maybe internal gills, the fin rays on the tail, and so on. So you've got these animals that are a weird mixture of fish-like and tetrapod-like features, or, or rather as archaeopteryx is a mixture of certain reptile-like and bird-like characteristics. And at the same time, these animals also possess some very weird features of their own, the strange numbers of digits on the limbs and so on. We also need to understand the fragmentary nature of much of the fossil material. Yes, some of the tetrapod material is reasonably complete, but there are many of these taxa that are based on extremely fragmentary remains, it's not always clear that the skeletal fragments belong even to the same animal. And clearly, where you have poor, the, where, where the data are poorest, you have the greatest potential for erroneous interpretation of the data. And so we have to be very careful here. And also, this is confounded by the fact that we do have this mosaic distribution of characters. And so it's very easy to have a small fragment of a jaw and not to be clear whether this is a fish jaw or whether this is a tetrapod jaw. And so we have some material now assigned to tetrapods that was originally described as fish-like, and we have some fish material that was originally described as tetrapod. So we, we need to bear this in mind, mosaic distribution of characters and the fragmentary nature of much of the fossil material. Let's come on to look at the Darwinist interpretations of these data. And there are a number of points that we can make. The first is about cladistics, the methodology of cladistics as a phylogenetic framework. When we talk about phylogeny, we're talking about the construction of family trees. Now, traditionally, Darwinists have tried to construct family trees by identifying ancestors and descendants in the fossil record. But many of them are recognizing that a major problem with this approach is the extreme patchiness of the fossil record and the fact that it is impossible to unambiguously identify one fossil as the ancestor of another. And the methodology of cladistics is presented by many contemporary Darwinists as a solution to that dilemma. They assert that although ancestry cannot be recognized, relatedness can be. And cladistics uses the characteristics that are shared by organisms to identify natural groups or clades, and the cladistic approach focuses on determining the sequence of acquisition of characters in the fossil record from which inferences are then drawn about the nature of the transition. Note that the methodology of cladistics is inherently Darwinian because it assumes from the outset the relatedness of all living things and assumes that similarities are a result of the relatedness of living things. And so because cladistics assumes from the outset the continuity of life, by its very nature, as a method, it is insensitive to, it is blind to, the discontinuities that creationists believe characterize living things. So we need a new methodology to uh, to construct uh, phylogenies, to look at the relatedness of 
living things that is sensitive to the, the, the discontinuities that we feel are very real features of the living world. Secondly, we have the whole rejection of this conquest of the land idea. And it's very much allied to that nucleodistic approach. The pervasive view has been, as I said, that this transition from fish to tetrapods was synonymous with the invasion of the land. And there were all these scenarios of the drying pond hypothesis that would explain the selection pressures involved. Well, today, those scenarios are increasingly rejected as untestable storytelling. I was present at a lecture by Dr. Per Alberg of the Natural History Museum at the Royal Institution, and uh, in the audience was Richard Dawkins, who's been mentioned on several occasions this week. And it was very interesting because Per Alberg made this very point. He rejected these as just-so stories, as uh, scenarios that really had no basis in science. They're outside the scope of science. Now, I was very interested that Richard Dawkins was there because if you've read his books, it seems to me that he goes in for a great deal of that kind of just-so storytelling. So I'd be interested to know what his thoughts were about that. But there is a rejection of this kind of storytelling, uh, at least in some Darwinian circles. We also have the problem that confronts Darwinians in terms of functional difficulties in explaining these transitions. And a great example of this was given last year at, the, uh, at a meeting in Manchester of the Paleontological Association. And I'll just briefly run through this example because it gives a flavor of the problems that we're presented with. In fish, the head is connected very firmly to the shoulder girdle. But in amphibians, the head is freed from the shoulder girdle for feeding and for locomotion. Now, Darwinists have to suppose that this arrangement where the head becomes detached from the, from the shoulder girdle had to happen incrementally by multitudes of small steps over very long periods of evolutionary time. But this is not a straightforward development. And the workers, Gudo and Homberger, at the Paleontological Association, used the spiny dogfish as their model, and they showed that in this animal, the shoulder girdle uh, is firmly attached to the vertebral column. It's an anchor for the muscles used in laterally undulating the body, in opening the mouth, in the contractions of the heart, and in the timing of the blood circulation through the gills. And all of those actions are synchronized together. They essentially form a single mechanical unit. And that arrangement is thought to apply to all fishes, extinct and living. And the problem that they were raising is how can we explain a transition from that fish-like arrangement to a tetrapod arrangement in Darwinian stepwise fashion, all the time having functional intermediates. And it's a real problem that confronts the Darwinian, and fortunately we don't have to be confronted with that. We also have the whole issue of gaps in the fossil record. And perhaps the key transition here is the transition from paired fins to limbs with digits. Now, in some of the presumed early tetrapod taxa, we don't have the limbs preserved, so we're not sure what they are like. But where the limbs are known, they are already fully developed and possess digits. They may possess strange numbers of digits, but they are clearly tetrapods with limbs and digits. And here we have a, a quote from Robert Carroll again, where he says, the primary focus of the fish-amphibian transition has been on changes in the paired appendages from a functional fin to a limb with digits. Pandarichthys shows no advances toward the tetrapod transition. Alberg provided evidence for a more derived structure of the proximal limb elements in Elgin which is intermediate in age between Pandarichthys and the upper Devonian genera with terrestrial limbs. But unfortunately, there is still no evidence at all of an intermediate stage in the evolution of the critical distal elements of the limb, the wrist, and ankle joints, and the digits. Now, it has been claimed that a fish called Sauropteris, which was, uh, it belonged to a group called Rhizodonts, and it's been claimed that this fish has a fin, a pectoral fin, that is remarkably similar to tetrapod limbs. 
The problem was that it was very incompletely known. This fish was only really known from the pectoral fin, and the rest of the fish was not described. Very recently, uh, within the last couple of years, a new rhizodont specimen of a creature called Gulugongia, a rhizodont from New South Wales, was described, and it had almost none of the features expected of a tetrapod ancestor. And Johansson and Alberg, who described this fish, said, the description of Gulugongia improves our understanding of rhizodont anatomy and shows conclusively that rhizodonts are less closely related to tetrapods than our osteolipiforms and elpistostegids. We conclude that the similarities between the pectoral appendage skeletons of rhizodonts and tetrapods are convergent and urge that rhizodont pectoral fins not be used as model ancestors for tetrapod limbs. Furthermore, in the lobe fin fish that are thought to be tetrapod ancestors, the pectoral fins are larger than the pelvic fins. These were front wheel drive animals. But in the early tetrapods, we have precisely the opposite arrangement. They are rear wheel drive animals with larger hind limbs than forelimbs. And none of these recent discoveries have shown any uh, evidence of how that transition took place. So again, there are major discontinuities still in the fossil record. Well, let's come on uh, as we come towards the end to look at creationist interpretations of the data, because not only are there challenges for Darwinians, there are challenges for us too. The first thing that we can say is that these Devonian tetrapods are chimeromorphs. Now let me explain what I mean here. They are mosaic forms that share features of two or more groups. Now we see a similar mosaic pattern of character distribution in a number of other groups, both fossil and living. Think about the duck-billed platypus, for example. It has features that we associate with mammals, such as hair and milk production, and yet it has some features that we might associate with reptiles, like egg laying. So it's a, a mosaic form. Perhaps the best known fossil example is one we've mentioned already, Archaeopteryx, which has bird-like features. It has feathers, but it also has some characteristics that we maybe associate with reptiles, like teeth and wing claws. Now, the evolutionist Stephen Jay Gould has called these organisms mosaic forms or chimeras. Kurt Wise, uh, an American creationist, calls these creatures chimeromorphs. And it appears that the created kinds are a unique combination of traits that are individually shared with members of other groups. Now, Darwinists interpret these mosaic forms as evolutionary intermediates that link major groups because they share features of more than one group. Note, however, that it's not the shared characteristics themselves that are intermediate in nature. It's their combination in a particular organism or group of organisms that is intermediate. If you look at the feathers in Archaeopteryx, they are fully formed flight feathers, aerodynamically designed. They're not half feather or half scale. Similarly with the claws and with the teeth. So we have a mosaic pattern of character distribution, but the individual characters themselves are not intermediate in nature. They're not transitional. And also, this mosaic pattern, in fact, confounds Darwinian models because it actually makes it incredibly difficult to identify natural groups that possess the right combination of characters to be considered ancestral. So there's a problem there. Now, how could we as creationists understand this mosaic distribution of characters? Well, these Devonian tetrapods are a mosaic of terrestrial and aquatic adaptations. And my understanding of this would be as a design feature. We can understand this from a creationist viewpoint as a unique design, a unique body plan for life in a particular ecological niche. It's thought that the habitat of these creatures was likely to be weed-infested, shallow water. 
So they were equipped by the Creator with features shared with certain fishes living in the same environment, such as paddle-shaped limbs, lateral lines, uh, ears that could hear underwater. On the other hand, at least some of them were amphibious and were able to make forays onto the land. And in their case, the limbs, such as in Ichthyostega, were designed not only for maneuverability in the water, but also as load-bearing structures. So we can understand this mosaic pattern as a design perspective. And then we come on to the geological context. Creationists that have published on the transition have considered the nature of the fossils, but there's actually been very little discussion about their geological context. And it's interesting that these peculiar, multi-digited, fish-like tetrapods are confined essentially to the upper Devonian, the Frasnian and the Femenian. There is one peculiar genus here called Crassigyrinus, which appears up there in the Visayan, and it's a strange eel-like creature with tiny limbs, which is a puzzle to Darwinians because it appears to be somewhat of an anachronism. Uh, in some respects, it's considered to be even more primitive than these tetrapods here, and it appears further up in the column. But by and large, they are confined to the Frasnian and the Fermenian. And then they disappear from the fossil record. At the end of the Fermenian and into the Tornasian, these creatures disappear. In fact, the subsequent vertebrate record throughout the Tornasian is very poor indeed. Very few assemblages of vertebrates are known, and this has become known as the Tornasian Gap. And then in the Visayan, we have the reappearance of tetrapods again. And we have great variety of tetrapods in the Visayan. And they are clearly animals that are uh, that are terrestrial and much more derived in evolutionary terms, much more advanced, if we can use those expressions, than uh, the earlier Devonian tetrapods. And so we have a sequence here in the fossil record. We have the Frasnian and Fermenian peculiar uh, tetrapods. We have a gap where very few fossils and uh, uh, vertebrate fossils are known. And then we have this explosion of of much more modern appearing uh, tetrapod type groups. And it's a challenge for us to understand this fossil sequence. How can we understand it? Well, the trackways and the body fossils that coincide here in the Upper <coughs> Devonian, here in the Fermenian and the Frasnian, suggest that this was a unique phase of Earth history when these multi-digited early tetrapods were thriving. And the Darwinian interpretation of this is confounded by the fact that we have no links connecting these creatures with the fish from which they are supposed to have evolved, or indeed no links showing how they might have given rise to later tetrapod assemblages. They just appear in this one narrow band of the geological column, seem to flourish, and then disappear. And we have to admit, I think, that at this stage we have no creationist explanation of why that is the case. Why do they just appear? Why are there no animals similar to these alive today? Why are there none in rocks either older or younger? Why do they just appear there in the Upper Devonian and then disappear? I think we have to admit as creationists we don't have a good explanation for that at present. And one of the things that I'd like to close with is to say that we clearly need further discussion and further work on this issue. Okay, well, let's sum up what's been said, and we'll draw some conclusions. We've looked at the early tetrapods. We've looked at their presumed ancestors. We've looked at the timing of the transition, the ecological setting of the transition, and we've tried to draw out some of the implications for us as creationists and also for Darwinians. We have to conclude by saying that despite these recent discoveries, the fish tetrapod transition remains contentious. The data and the interpretation of the data are a source of very lively debate and controversy in the literature. A robust rationale for concluding that the Upper Devonian tetrapods 
evolved from a fish ancestor, or that they gave rise to later tetrapod lineages is completely lacking. But much more work is required of us to develop a fuller creationist understanding of these strange animals and their ecological and geological context. Thank you.